Hey everybody, it's Standing for Truth coming to you tonight. We are live. I've got a very special guest with me tonight. Um, creationist Bill Morgan. I've also got uh, Ron Matt, as, as everybody knows, who's going to be my co-interviewer. Uh, Bill, welcome to uh, the show. Welcome to Standing for Truth. I want to thank you so much. I know you're, you're, you're busy schedule, so thanks for giving us your time. Uh, tonight, we're going to discuss creation versus evolution and, and other related uh, topics. Bill, for anybody who, who may not be familiar with you, if you wanted to give just a brief uh, introduction, and then we'll go right into uh, some questions. Well, first, thanks for having me on. Uh, first off, I was born, and then I was raised going to church for about 14 years, and my ninth grade biology teacher taught me the theory of evolution as if it were fact. I believed him, and I uh, figured the Bible was wrong about science. It also had to be wrong about sin, which was very convenient for me. And so about 12 years, I claimed to be an atheist. And I'm thinking of putting on my tombstone, I thank God I was an atheist. Because at the age of 26, I had to build my own faith. And it started with facts on science and the fossil record. And as I did more and more research, I came to the, the conclusion that science does not falsify the Bible, that science glorifies God. God and the Bible have no contradiction, and then I would tear into my Bible. And so for about 30 years, I'm a creationist, and I love talking to atheists, agnostics, and believers about this important topic. And I work as an engineer uh, 35 years as a mechanical engineer for the Navy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for coming on once again, Bill. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, and I know Matt is as well. Um, why don't we get right into it then? Uh, question number uh, one, Bill, I think it's really, really important. Um, you know, what should everybody's goal be in the creation versus evolution debate? Well, not just in the creation evolution debate. Everybody's goal in life should be truth. Often everybody wants to be proven right. I do, an atheist does, etc. But we really have to discern, are we really seeking what is true? And I believe if a person is open-minded and seeks truth, uh, they would reject atheistic thought and evolutionism and uh, believe in creation, that there is a designer, and that humans only have human ancestors. I love to start with science. I believe scientific truth uh, confirms uh, biblical teaching and falsifies evolutionary and atheist thinking. Truth should be everybody's goal, and everybody listening to this should ask yourself, is truth really my goal, or am I just trying to prove what I want to be true? Amen, brother. I couldn't agree more. I think an appropriate you know, follow-up question to that would be, um, what do we mean or what do you mean by evolution? It seems to have, you know, many different meanings and people kind of just throw it out there. It almost seems like there's a bait and switch sometimes coming from the evolutionists. So, uh, Bill, you know, what do we mean by evolution? Well, what am I guess if I have it is I'm a really very simple person. I'm not a genius. And evolution is a word. That word might mean one thing to this guy and another thing to that guy. The word means change. But if somebody asks me, Bill, what about evolution? I give my quick definition. I believe apes make apes, people make people, and ladybugs make what? Ladybugs. Ladybugs. Penguins <laughs> make. Penguins make penguins. That's genetics. That's biochemistry. That's not religion. If someone were to just say, oh, evolution is fake, well, the definition of the word might mean different things to different people. I like the term microevolution, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Yes. Uh, variation among a kind. Uh, Darwin's book, Origin of the Species, most of it was wonderful because he talked about microevolution, the different size of a bird's beak. That's wonderful. It's still a bird. It's still a finch. Right. So people shouldn't say evolution is nonsense because someone might be thinking they're talking about natural selection or microevolution. So from my experience, I like to just say apes make apes, people make people, and whales make 
whales. And that's genetics, biochemistry, taxonomy, zoology, paleontology. It's not religious. I couldn't agree more there, Bill. I always say, you know, if by evolution you mean dogs and wolves are related, then yes, we're not going to have a problem. But if by evolution you mean dogs, bacteria, and pine trees are related, well, that's where we're going to have our, you know, difference in, in opinion. Um, I guess a, since you mentioned created kinds or just kinds in general, I think it would be a, a good question to jump right into, you know, what is a biblical kind or what do you mean by kinds? And just to back up a little bit, it's so good for everybody to know that nobody knows everything. We're all in a learning process. Right. When I was a young, eager creationist way back in the 90s, I called up the Institute for Creation Research. I still remember. And I said, hello, what's the kind? And they said the family level, canine for dogs, equine for horses, feline for cats. So the closest and the Linnaeus classification would be at the family level. And so just a few weeks ago, I called John Sanford. You guys know John, right? Yes, love John Sanford. Uh, Cornell professor, invented the gene gun, know more, knows more about DNA than anyone. And he said, there's many definitions of species. People disagree on species, but everybody agrees on uh, the family level. And so that's what a creationist, at least I'm only speaking for myself, would say a kind is. Dog, cat, horse. Right. And and I'll find a lot talking to evolutionists or just even watching, you know, debates where creationists are debating evolutionists, you know, I'll often say, you know, nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog or come from a non-dog. Just like you said, you know, dogs make dogs, humans make humans. But they'll often follow up by saying, well, that's what we would expect if evolution were true. Of course, dogs produce dogs. If dogs didn't produce dogs, that would disprove the theory. You know, how do you follow up with, with something like that, Bill? Well, like I said, I'm a simple guy and that sounds pretty confusing to me. They're almost saying, I believe in the theory of evolution and I admit there's no evidence for it. <laughs> yeah. If reptiles are the ancestors to birds, uh, I'm originally from Buffalo. That means lizards are the ancestor to birds. There should be billions of blizzards. Okay. Where are the animals where a leg is evolving into a wing? A, a scale is evolving into a feather. Evidence is a beautiful thing in science. And they would admit that their evidence either never, well, they wouldn't admit it never existed. They just say it no longer exists. Well, why not? When I street witness, I love talking to people, I make a bold prediction. I predict, I say, your eyes will never see an ape man. Your eyes will never see a bird lizard. Why not? And they'll say, uh, they're all gone. I'll say either they're all gone or they never existed. And because of genetics and biochemistry, we know it is impossible for them to exist. Evolutionism might have been cute during Darwin's time when people didn't know what the cell was, but it's really intellectually inexcusable to believe it nowadays with our knowledge of genetics and DNA. But your eye, and oh, sometimes I ask people this, uh, standing, would you role play just an evolutionist for me? Of course. It'd be okay. an honor. <laughs> right. Well, standing first, I'm always nice to people. I really respect people and I like them. I was an atheist. I have no uh, axe to grind. So standing, uh, are you an evolutionist? Yes. Great. Okay. You're yes. an evolutionist. Are you an evolutionist because your eyes have seen the evidence for it? Or are you an evolutionist because your ears have only heard there's evidence for it? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, as an evolutionist, I guess it is, I guess I haven't really seen the observable evidence. Well, I'm glad you're being honest. And I would say to the person, I encourage you to keep looking for the evidence. Science relies on observation. You've heard many times evolution is true, but your eyes have never seen it. Keep looking, my friend. And when you don't see blizzards, eight men, all these transitional forms, keep asking yourself, why can't I see anything? Why are the textbooks? Here's another question. 
So the person is admitting they've never seen it. They've only heard it. Yeah. That's blind faith. They should use their eyes to look for it. Here is a wonderful question for an evolutionist. Uh, if you don't mind another one standing. Of course. Okay. So you believe in the theory of evolution, correct? Yes. Okay. Why do the textbooks only have drawings as evidence instead of photographs? Um, I guess because we we weren't around millions and millions of years ago when these many species were evolving. So we have to draw them according to our best inference or interpretation. Okay, I respect that. But you're admitting there's no observational evidence to believe in these transitional forms, just drawings. I, I think because we see you know, a variety of dogs, if we can see that amount of change in just observable time, maybe we can extrapolate that to mean a dog today came from a non-dog long ago and far away, perhaps. Okay, perhaps is a key word there, but you're admitting there's no observational evidence. A lot of perhaps yeah. and conjecture. Yes, I would be admitting that. Okay, and that's what people need to realize. How come I don't see any evidence for it? I believe right. the theory of evolution only because of my ear, never because of my eyes. And scientific facts, here's my dog right here, proof of creation. Uh, <laughs> scientific facts made me realize I was lied to. We're not related to bacteria and reptiles and fish. And my reaction was, I'm not very happy. I don't like to be lied to. I love truth. And I'll be an atheist if it's true. I'll believe I'm related to ape men, if it's what? If it's, if true. it's true. Right, that's a good point. And everyone should be willing to change their mind. Me, you, and everybody listening. What about, Bill, since you were talking about transitionals there, what about those few rare exceptions that you find the evolutionist often brings up? For example, you know, one that comes to mind is Archaeopteryx or maybe Tiktaalik. You know, those few rare ones that they'll choose out of all the billions of fossils that are actually out there. Okay, well, Archaeopteryx is called by uh, many uh, evolutionists as a bird, a true bird, a strong flyer. Alan Fiducia of North Carolina State, hardcore evolutionist, calls it a bird. Um, I, can't I, I can't remember his first name, Grismick. He wrote the Encyclopedia of Animal Evolution, calls it a bird. I'm, I'm all for Archaeopteryx being a bird. It had wings, I had feathers, et cetera. It had a couple characteristics that are rare but are still found in birds today. Uh, Tiktaalik is really a sad thing. Anyone who thinks it is uh, evidence for the theory of evolution should Google it and see what they have for Tiktaalik. Look at the picture and really say, is this our best evidence? It's a beat up fossil of a fish. And they say because of its neck, you can don't have to never believe me. Look for yourself. Uh, it's related to uh, reptiles. It's neck. How about legs? Uh, just a very, very weak uh, piece of evidence right there. And anyone out there, creationists, et cetera, if you're stumped, say, I, I don't have an answer. Could I research that? Uh, it's almost, I don't want to digress, but uh, do you guys like the Olympics? Oh, yeah. Okay. What's your favorite event uh, standing in the Olympics? My favorite ev uh, event would probably be, ooh, that's... Uh, Hmm. I guess tr track, you know, tr track and field. Okay. Could you name an event just for kicks? An event just for kicks? Yeah. A hundred meter. Oh, right, right. Yeah. A hundred meter, hundred okay. meter race. So we could be sitting on the couch eating barbecue, potato chips and saying, wow, man, I wish I could run that fast. But neither one of us have seen the hundreds and hundreds of hours and weight training and discipline and diet these men and women put into to be that fast. Correct? Correct. Figure skating, you might say, wow, I wish I could skate like that person. Well, I used to skate a little bit, and I saw these people fall on their rear end time after time. You do too, right? You're from Canada. 
uh, these people are putting in time and effort to get that good. So the point is, people could look at Ray Comfort and say, wow, I wish I knew as much as he did. Well, he put in thousands of hours. So if anyone out there wants to be better in what they have as a passion, you got to put the time in. Like, oh, I've never heard of these fossils. Well, you put in the time and you'll get better and better. And if you put in the time and have an open mind, you'll be a stronger creationist. So don't be scared of the fossils. Look up what they have and do the research. So you don't think that God could have used evolution to create? I'd love to role play. Who wants to role play on this question? I'll, I'll do it. Okay. Uh, do you think God used evolution to create? Uh, why not? Okay. Okay. If you think he did, I have a question for you. May I ask it? Sure. What did he create first, lungs or hearts? I uh, don't know. Eyes or optic nerves? Don't know. Brains or lizard? Brains, brains or livers? Brains or livers? Don't know. Okay. God does not create things. God creates systems. Systems are components of many, many other systems. Okay, for a human body to work, the is the human body a system? Yes. Yes, the human body is a system. Many, many things have to work. Is the circulatory system a system? Yes. Yes, it is. Is the heart a system? No. Well, the heart is a system. Many yeah. components make up the heart. <laughs> yeah. Is the tissue in the heart a system? Yes. Yep. Are the cells a system? Yes. Are the molecules a system? I hope this isn't dragging on too much. Are the cells a system? Yeah. Are the molecules a system? Yep. And even the atoms are a system. If evolution is true, what evolved first? Protons, neutrons, or electrons? Systems work together. You can't get a system in a living thing step-by-step -step process. And we live in an ecosystem and a solar system. God, and I don't want to hit, get hit by lightning, could not have created a living thing through a step-by-step -step system. He did not make brains on a Monday, lungs on a Tuesday, stomachs on a Wednesday, hearts on a Thursday. The only way to create a living being with all these millions of systems is instantly, like the Bible teaches. So well, if, the, go ahead. Well, if the Bible is teaching that, how come so many Christians believe in evolution then? Well, Christian, well, uh, well, not to digress on that, if God couldn't do it and God has an IQ of infinity, if God could make a living human by evolution, his IQ is infinity, nature couldn't do it with an IQ of zero. Nature could not make a lung. Nature could not make a lung and a heart, a blood vessel. It is intellectually dishonest. So why do Christians believe in it? I've talked to a lot of Christians and they get very angry, even though I talk nice to them. Peer pressure. Many Christians are saying, well, that's not my field. But that smart guy over there says we are related to ape men. I will trust that smart guy. And then they try to say God used evolution. But my, my son and I play a game. We play a game where we say sentences that have never been said before. Like, we'll, I'll say, son, I got a sentence that's never been said before. He goes, what is it, dad? Gee, I like getting battery cables and attaching my ears and then jumping out of a tree. Probably never been said before. Well, I don't think this sentence has ever been said before. A man is reading his Bible and he says, hey, Phyllis, look at right here. Man is related to an ape man. It's right here in the Bible. No Christian has ever come to that conclusion that God used evolution to create from the Bible. But they're subjected to peer pressure. And sadly, many seminaries are buying into this peer pressure and they believe it because of their ears. Their eyes don't see the evidence and their eyes don't see it in the Bible. But I almost think they're like at a cocktail party and they want to be accepted by their peers and that they will believe in the theory of evolution. That's my opinion. 
But I ask them for Bible verses to support it. They don't have it. I ask them for physical evidence for it. They don't have it. They believe it because of peer pressure. They want to please people. Wow. So uh, this being a creationist channel, then how would how old would you say that the earth is for the for people, especially Christians? Remember the great Clint Eastwood? Oh, yeah. I love Clint Eastwood. He said a man's got to know his limitations. OK, there's only one thing I'm sure of. The earth is at least 59 years old. <laughs> only thing I know. Right. Anything beyond that is conjecture. Some people say thousands of years. Some people say billions of years. I believe it is thousands of years old. And uh, my favorite reason, can I try to get my PowerPoint going here? Of course, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I, I'm new to this to people watching it. Okay. I'm gonna start with science, why the earth isn't billions of years old. Perfect. Okay. Oh, maybe if I click on that. Oh, don't look. Losing valuable time here. Okay. This is my. Perfect. Yep. I can, I can share that screen as well, uh, Bill. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. So I would like to pro provide eight reasons the earth can't be billions of years old. Just for fun, I want to see if you guys can guess. Next one. Do you want to do the page down? Um, you'll have to uh, okay. switch the slides. There, Yeah, we can see that. Okay, there's four good reasons the earth can't be billions of years old. There's four more reasons. It starts with letter E. Erosion. Erosion. I have a Bing as when I turn on my computer and half the time they have beautiful pictures of erosion. People look around. This earth is falling apart. I took my family to Bryce Canyon. Have you guys ever been to Bryce Canyon in Utah? No, never. A lot of people have never even heard of it. It's better than the Grand Canyon because you can get right in it. The tour guide said the rocks were 50 million years old. I was rubbing the rock like I would pet the head of a little puppy very gently. Guess what the sandstone was doing as I was rubbing it about as soft as you could rub it? Flaking off. Flaking off. I said, kids, this rock is 50 million years old. No way, dad. I predict Bryce Canyon will be gone in a thousand years. It's falling apart from erosion. Yet the tour guides are saying it's 50 million years old. The planet is eroding. It, it cannot be that long, be that old. There's too many genetic mutations for life to exist in that long. The sun converts mass into energy. It's called the faint sun paradox. As the sun ages, it throws out more heat. The faint sun paradox. Billions of years ago, the, uh, the earth would have been one big ice cube even, even evolutionists admit that in their own uh, papers that the earth would have been too cold to support life. So, oops, there's a just there's millions of pictures. Does that look like a billions year old earth to you? Everything's no. being, everything's being washed in the sea. This happened in Jordan. One day of flooding, uh, complete massive damage. And a little fun trivia, guess which country came and spent millions of dollars to help Jordan? Israel. That's something. They brought doctors, engineers, etc. cetera. Uh, they're a good neighbor. So a fun question, can concrete bend? <laughs> nope. nope. Yes. Wet. Wet it can. Wet. See the picture to the left? Concrete can bend when it's wet. When it sets, it can't bend anymore. Any, I know out here in California, we constantly see bent strata. See that? That's in Barstow, my favorite vacation spot. 
You can go shooting, ride dirt bikes, have all kinds of fun. See the Bent Strata guys? Yeah. Yeah. Try to get an evolutionist explain to you how strata bends. It can't bend after it is set. The Bible teaches in Psalm 104, first there was a flood, then right after the flood, valleys sank, mountains rose. These valleys sank and mountains rose right after the flood when the soil was soft, like the concrete before it set. Yes. This is in the Ukraine. Do you think this happened over millions and millions of years or it happened rapidly before the rocks set? It had to be rapid. Yeah, and an open-minded person would believe that too if they didn't have an agenda. And if you Google bent strata, you'll see thousands of pictures. These photos, in my opinion, confirm Psalm 104. The earth is recent. There was a flood, and after the flood, valleys sank, mountains rose. Now look at this, many layers on top of each other. That's the Grand Canyon. Those layers were deposited at the same time and had to bend when they were soft, not rigid. But I know the intellectual peer pressure of people rolling their eyes if they think you're young earth. The number one weapon of evolutionists and atheists is not science. It's shaming, where people are just, oh, I, I don't want to be criticized, picked on, and ashamed, and they buy into it. But sadly, the church isn't doing a good uh, job of equipping uh, the believers on why to trust the Bible. We act like isolation is too much. We have to engage the world in fun discussion about important stuff. That's true. That's true. But what about what about dinosaurs then? Oh. I'm sorry, one last one. I'm sorry about that. No problem. Every civilization dates back 5,000 years. All of, and I have many, many more references than this. The first one's a beauty. Every civilization, 5,000 years. Iranian, 4,000 BC. Indian, Chinese. And I have many, many more samples of that. If history had civilizations going back 40,000 years, I'd look pretty silly saying the earth is 6,000 years. <laughs> but non-biased history of civilizations, about 5,000 years, which is the time of the Tower of Babel, which was after the flood, when people spread out and built pyramids all over the earth. Okay. Amen, that's some great evidence. And the goal isn't religion. The goal isn't God. The goal is truth. If you seek truth, you'll find God. And I noticed during... Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh. What did I do? <laughs> no problem. All, all you have to do is click um, stop <laughs> screen share. Oh. Middle. Okay. <laughs> Psychedelic, man. There we go. You're doing great, Bill. You're doing great. Um, a, a couple of things came to mind during um, you know, your great answer there. I really appreciate it. Earlier, you mentioned Dr. John Sanford, which is great. And also you mentioned as one of your um, you know, prime examples of, of why we exist in a young universe and especially a young genome is mutation accumulation. And I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, Dr. John Sanford's amazing work on genetic entropy. Can you elaborate maybe more on, you know, mutations, mutation accumulation, um, Bill? Sure. We have a genome and a genome is like a long word. If you randomly rearrange the letters of a word, you lose information. If you had the word Mississippi, which is four letters, fairly long word, and randomly took out an I, added an extra S, switched letters around, after a while, to use a technical term, you have gobbledygook. It doesn't convey information. Mutations are a rearrangement of our genome, and the genome makes proteins. If you rearrange the genome, you make fewer proteins than you could before. Mutations are a loss of genetic information. So you have more mutations than your parents. Your parents had more mutations than their parents. 
you go back in time, you're having fewer and fewer mutations. Right. If the atheist thinks the genome happened by random chance. Well, how does chance produce a genome with no errors in it? Yeah. Only God with an IQ of infinity could do that, not nature with an IQ of zero. Very good point. It's funny because you, you you find the evolutionist saying that, you know, mutations are the creator. Mutations lead to true novelties, novel information. But just like you said there, Bill, you know, mutations destroy existing information. We have more mutations than our, you know, um, grandparents. So we're, in a way, we're degenerating from a once perfect creation. Yep. I believe in de-evolution. Right. Yeah, I've, and, and made, I've made cartoons, and one of my cartoons was, it says, delivery room, and the caption was, when atheists pray, and the person is praying, oh, dear Lord, please don't let it be mutated. <laughs> Nobody stands in front of an x-ray machine hoping to get mutated. It's, it's a hopeless hope to think mutations could turn bacteria into a well. Right, yeah. By losing information. Yes, by losing information. If you keep giving me $10, are you going to be rich? <laughs> nope. Let's try it, though, okay? <laughs> yeah. This. Keep giving me money. See if you get rich. It's, it's funny because they think they can get rich by losing money. They think they can take one or two steps up that mountain and then 10 steps backward and somehow be able to climb that mountain. I mean, it's, it's just not possible. I look at it as a flea trying to jump across 100 million Grand Canyons. And if you can't make it across one Grand Canyon, nothing's going to work. Right. I think that's a good point. It sounds like it comes down to limits. You know, we believe in change like you were saying earlier, Bill. We just believe that that change has limits. Absolutely. You can only make a racehorse so fast. I think that's my opinion. You heard about all the racehorses that are dying out here? No, all the racehorses that really? are dying? Yeah, about 30 have died at a racetrack out here. It's a big story. I think they've bred these horses so much for speed, they've lost toughness and ruggedness, and they're uh, breaking their legs more and more because they're breeding them for ultimate speed. There's always a cost. If you're breeding a horse for speed, he's not as durable as he was uh, before. Point. You can get only so much milk out of a cow, and often it shortens their lifespan. I've talked to farmers about that. But there's only limits. And when you selectively breed, there's always a little bit of a cost associated. Right. That's a good point. I mean, even in dogs, you see change, you see variation. But there's got, I, I think the evolutionist is often backed into a corner when you ask them, you know, can we get a dog as, as big as, you know, an, an elephant or a whale? Because at the end of the day, there exist animals that are as big as elephants and whales, like elephants and whales. Therefore, all we see, like you said, are limits. That's what we observe, and that more and more we learn we learn about genetics. That's more it teaches. And one thing for the, the skeptic to consider, John Sanford, I, I like to call him, he told me this. He said, Bill, every three months, we have to throw out something that we knew about DNA and genetics, right. and it's more and more complex. It doesn't get more and more simple and easy to understand. So every new change, in my opinion, gives more glory to a creator with an IQ of infinity instead Amen. of with an IQ of zero. <laughs> Amen, brother. I, you often hear from the evolutionists when it comes to the, you know, the DNA language, the DNA code, they'll say, well, the majority of our genome is junk anywhere, mm -hmm. and, you, and junk DNA, evolutionary leftovers. Um, is, is that true that the majority of our genome is junk, Bill? I've been doing creation a little bit, and that used to be common. If they were to say that today, I'd give them a little hug, and I'll say that is so 15 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, at least 15 years ago, uh, Dr. Mark Eastman, you guys ever heard of him? He was a big-time creationist. They were called entrons. They said, hey, look, at part of the DNA doesn't program for uh, proteins. It's junk. It's a worthless right. leftover. But Mark Eastman said, the so-called junk DNA is like a conductor to an orchestra. The DNA that codes for proteins are like the musical instruments. 
And the entrons are perhaps even more complex because they say, you turn on now, you turn off now, you turn on in a different way to make a different protein because as you know, we have more proteins than we have genes, which is a big problem for the atheist that we have five times, my understanding is five times more proteins. So the same gene can make different proteins. And that's from the uh, so-called junk DNA. And I don't think any enlightened atheist would call them junk DNA anymore. Have you guys run into any that still do? Um, yeah, I mean, believe it or not, I, I do. They'll, um, whether they'll call it, you know, evolutionary leftovers, or I've, I've, also, I've often asked, you know, what's the, what's the max amount of functionality you believe the genome can have? And they'll often say between 10 and 20% function, which means in a way they're admitting that they believe the other 80% is useless or junk. Hmm. Well, uh, I say this with respect, they need a little hog and they need to take a biology class. <laughs> I would agree. And have you guys ever taken a college class? You didn't care about the grade, you just wanted to learn? Um, yeah, I, I think so. It's wonderful, I encourage everybody listening, just for fun, take biology, take astronomy, take geology, and just learn, it's such a different environment. And I did it and I'm so glad I did. I learned a lot more about evolution and biology and DNA. So any young eager or old eager, creationist or open-minded evolutionist, take a biology class at night and learn, keep learning, right? Um, and, and, and that kind of makes me wonder about, because when you think of biology, when you think of the cell, you know, one single cell is more complicated than, than the space shuttle. So we'll often look to design, Bill, but how do we know if something is actually the result of say design or chance? Ah, okay. Well, let's go back to our, I have a, here's my dog, which is definitely a design. Suppose the cell happened by chance. What part of the cell evolved first? Hmm. That's a, that's a tough one. It's an impossible one. It's a right. system. <laughs> God makes systems and the whole cell works. Oh, I did it again. Sorry about that. No problem. You're doing great, Bill. Yep, we, we see you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Oops. Okay, close your eyes. Oops, there's a good one there. Okay, suppose you come home from work. You walk up your driveway and you see 15 stones in this pattern. Would you think that pattern of stones is a result of design, like somebody carefully placed each stone? Or the result of chance, like somebody tossed the stones. Wait, we don't see your image. Oh, I'm sorry. Hit uh, the screen share. Okay, screen share. Now, now go down there here. Can you see that? Uh, uh, no. Okay. It would have to be just to your, um, I guess, the left hand corner. It's like a green icon with a yep. white arrow yep i clicked on the arrow screen share okay you then your screen share oh okay i got it all right there we go perfect it went psychedelic on me again <laughs> <laughs> okay so you come home from work you walk up your driveway you see 15 stones in that pattern would your best guess be the pattern's a result of design like somebody carefully placed each stone or is the pattern the result of chance? What's your best guess? <laughs> chance or design? No, chance. Chance is a good guess, but you couldn't be sure because you weren't there. Right. You're guessing, hey, I think that pattern's by chance. Suppose you come home from work the next day, you walk up your driveway and you see this on your driveway. You see six stones in a pretty straight line. What's your best guess? Is that by design, like somebody planned it, or yeah. chance? Yeah, someone left that there for you to see. Okay, so you could say, I think that's a design, but you cannot be 100% sure because you weren't what? Weren't there. So you could say, I'm 99% sure that's a design, but I admit I have 1% faith because I wasn't there. 
Correct. It's not blind faith to think that's a design. It's a rational faith. So suppose you come home for work the next day, you walk up your driveway and you see this. Now there's 150 stones in a pretty good circle. Would your guess be that's by design or by chance? Design again. But you can't be 100% sure because you weren't what? Weren't there. You weren't there. You could say I'm 99.9999999, a lot of 9% sure, but just a little bit of faith that it's a design because you weren't there. Now, this gets really deep. If you think that happened by chance, it's possible. But I believe that's the inverse of design. You could be 0.0001% sure that happened by chance, but your faith is 99.9999. You follow me? Right. The rational explanation is that's a design, but neither one of us knows because we weren't there. So my question for you, gentlemen, what is more complex, the human eye or 150 stones in a circle? Oh, the human eye. Is the human eye the result of design or chance? Design. But design, you can't sure. be 100% sure because you weren't there at the time of creation. Correct. You got 99.9 right. on the earth 28 times. But all of us have a little bit of faith, but you and I do not have blind faith. It's very rational to conclude the human eye is a design. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make a lot of sense. The more complex, the more functional, the more of a pattern you see, the more likely it's a design. But both sides have faith. The atheist has the irrational, non-scientific, blind faith. Well, especially because they believe that all this came by chance from an explosion long ago from nothing. It, 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 like you said, we have rational, logical faith. They have a blind faith. Uh, I think, and I say this politely, well, there's four types of atheists. Let me get rid of this. Okay, stop sharing. I'm getting good at this. Okay. Okay. <laughs> told you you'd master it quick <laughs> nobody became an atheist because they observed the human hand a pelican or a sea lion and said yeah that could have happened by chance right briefly there's four types of atheists in my opinion atheist number one mad at god suppose you were four years old and your mom was very very sick what would a typical four-year-old do when their mommy was really sick? Oh, dear Lord, please, please, Lord, make my mommy better. I need my mommy. Don't let her die, Lord, please. Mommy gets worse and worse and worse and worse and dies a horrible death. What might be the response of that child? He might grow to hate God, blame God. He might blame God. Sure. He hates God. He's mad at God. God, you didn't answer my prayer. You must hate me, God. So I hate you and I'm going to fight you. So how do they fight God? Their arms are too short to punch him in the nose. I'm going to take away your glory. I'm going to fight you. That's atheist number one. And believe it or not, I could understand that perhaps. Didn't happen to me. Or suppose a young boy is being abused sexually. Please, Lord, please make it stop. And it never stops. I'm at war with you. I don't believe in you anymore. I hate you. So these people basically sweep the floor and get God out of their life. Now they have a vacuum. They have to explain matter, energy, life, the human eye. It happened by chance. It happened by chance over time. Their conclusion is driving the evidence. You see what I mean? That there can't be a God. Why would my mom die a death like that? And so they're trying to fill their vacuum with junk science, anti-science, no science. And they are very passionate. I think this is important. Many of these hardcore atheists have a stronger belief in God than 99% of the people at your church. 
but instead of loving God, they hate God with a passion. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, because they're spending, you know, the greater portion of their life fighting this God. You know, we're loving and worshiping this God, but like you said, they're fighting or attacking or trying to disprove this God. I'm convinced Richard Dawkins has a stronger faith in the existence of God than almost any Christian in any church. But he has admitted to having a very hard childhood. I've seen the quotes. He's got a very, very strong faith, but it's a faith that he's turning into anger and hate. He didn't observe the cell and say it did happen by chance. Look how simple it is. Nonsense. The cell is a beautiful design, but he's emotionally driven. So that's atheist number one. Atheist number two, they hear about creation. They say that makes sense. Nah, I don't want to listen to any rules. I want to do what I want to. It's called the flesh. So they say, there's no rules. The Bible is wrong. Atheism. That was me at the age of 14. I didn't want to listen to the rules. I like the idea of atheism. Atheist number three, they're worried about what other people think about them. Peer pressure, shaming. So they believe in it. Atheist number four is my favorite one. They've never heard anything else. That's all we've been taught. And these people love to hear the creation message. So atheist number four has never heard it. That's the person atheist number one is deathly afraid they hear anything about creation. If they were so sure of their atheism, they'd say, sure, explain that nonsense to them. Instead, their powerful weapon of shaming and the lawsuit is keeping people from even hearing the word God in school. Because government workers have one main goal, don't mess up the pension. And even if they believe in God, I'm not going to stir it up and get in trouble. Because a lot of these God haters, that's their goal, to shame and intimidate. But they don't bring the science to the table. That's exactly right. You know, they don't bring the science to the table. The creationists are bringing the science to the table. And just like you said, you know, nobody, no, no child, no one is taught that there's no God or that, you know, this cell of amazing complexity and, and clear design happened by chance. You, you have to learn that somewhere. So I, I think that was a phenomenal um, answer, Bill. Um, what about, since we're on the topic of design, what about when atheists will bring up examples of bad design? And there's a ton of examples that, you know, they bring up, they'll even bring up, um, you know, bacteria that may cause illness or, you know, diseases and uh, oh, just, just in general, the argument of bad design. Well, first, I honestly, when I talk to the people, I like to be friendly and comfortable and fun. Never, I'm smarter than you, I'm better than you, etc. So if someone says that to me, I say, so if you're saying it's a bad design, you're still admitting it's a design, right? Right. <laughs> okay. So sometimes I say, do you believe in intelligent design? And they say, no. They go, okay, do you believe in stupid design? Right? Well, that was supposed to be a joke. Sorry about that. But <laughs> if it's a bad design, it's a design. So I always like to ask them for examples. And you're saying uh, bacteria that can cause illness? Yes. So I, I guess that would be more um, evil. Like, why would God create something that would lead or result in suffering, death, illness? Great. I, that's something I think we've all thought about. Uh, Dennis Prager, and I'm not diverting, Dennis Prager said, the theist has one big problem. That's explain explaining suffering. The atheist has infinite problems. Every atom, every cell, every animal, every plant, okay? So we have one big problem, and explaining suffering is a big problem. Let's all admit that, right? But I always like to start with, I'm Bill. I'm not God, right? You're asking me, why would God do this? My daughter, when she was two, had leukemia. She went through a lot of chemotherapy at Chalk Hospital. And I like to say that your guest was bitter, angry, and furious at God because of my daughter having cancer. Have you guys ever been mad at God because things weren't going well? Oh, early yeah. on. Well, I was really mad, but I could never deny God existed because of design. So at the hospital, even though I was mad at God, I'm reading about red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. 
and I'm saying, God, you are awesome. You're a great designer. I am sorry I am mad at you, but I am. Please help me get through this. And not to divert, I kept reading my Bible when I was mad at God. And a verse came through that meant nothing during the good times. The verse said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Right. During the good times, I said, oh, that's cute. And turn the page. When I felt forsaken, that verse meant so much that Jesus felt forsaken on the cross. Jesus was ticked off about his suffering, but he persevered. We have to be people who persevere. But the cool thing is Jesus doesn't look down and say, you loser, you scumbag, how could you be mad? Instead, he's the advocate to the Father. I went through suffering, and I understand it. So to get back to the suffering, I don't know. I'm not God. I read the Bible. This is a temporary existence. This is a time of trial towards eternity. It's what the Bible teaches. It is a cursed creation with death, pain, and suffering. And the true measure of somebody's faith is their faith during trials. Suppose you were a billionaire and this beautiful girl is just dying to go out with you. You're not sure about what? Does she like you or does she like the money? Suppose you really don't have a lot of money. You don't have much to offer in that way, but she's crazy about you. Now you know. I think our faith is measured during the trials. And too many people's foundation for belief is if I'm happy enough, I'll believe in God. But if I'm suffering too much, I'm not going to believe in God. Well, that's emotional. We need a solid foundation, and creation can be that foundation. So getting back to why is there suffering and pain? During my daughter's leukemia, I listened to a uh, tape. This was a long time ago. A tape by Kent Hovind. And the longest conversation between God and a human was to Job. Nobody suffered more than Job. The question, and I'll, I'll give the answer. I won't put you guys on the spot. The question is, what was God's explanation to Job because of his suffering? And the answer is, God never told Job why he was suffering. But Job gave, or God gave 40 examples to Job why he could trust him. Can you make the sun rise? Can you make a bird? Can you make a mountain? Can you make a sky? God is saying, trust me. So I believe, and I don't like them at all. If I was God, hamburgers would be a health food. I think uh, you'll get a kick out of that. Diet pepper or Dr. Pepper would make you healthy. <laughs> there'd be no cancer. There'd be no death if I was God, but I'm not God. I am Bill. So no matter what you believe, everybody listening to this is you are going to die. You have two choices. You can be bitter about it or you can be humble about it. I'm not saying you have to be happy about it, but I choose to be humble about it. I'm getting older. My knees are getting older. I just say, may your will be done, God, because you're in charge. You're the boss. I'm not crazy about getting older, but I'm humble instead of bitter about it. And creation can make us humble. Pride is the number one enemy of God. God loves the humble heart. And if you need to be humble, just study creation. Study a blade of grass. Study an ant. Study the stars at night. Just say, you're in charge. You're the boss. I submit to your will, whether I like it or not. Amen, brother. That's a phenomenal answer. Um, you know, we we should just look up into the sky and, and just, you know, yell out and, and worship and praise what a wonderful God we serve. So I, I think you, you put that perfectly. Um, Bill, just to jump into a, a question that was um, – I think a lot of people um, love to hear the answer to, and a lot of people are really interested in would be the topic of, of dinosaurs. And I know not only myself, but a lot of people would love to hear your answer on, you know, how did dinosaurs fit into the biblical creation worldview? Okay. A great first question. Oh, uh, on my website, if you don't mind if I mention my website, do you? No, of course. Go ahead. 
it needs work, and I'm going to start working on it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I work a lot of hours. I've neglected my website. But on my website, I have an IQ quiz. And it looks like this where I ask questions. My website is fishdontwalk.com. Fishdontwalk.com? Yep. I encourage everybody to look at it. You can PDF it and download it. This is exactly what I needed when I was 14, science facts to support creation. And one of my questions is about dinosaurs. And here's my question. Are dinosaurs evidence for evolution or evidence for extinction? Extinction. Absolutely. Dinosaurs show up in the fossil record 100% designed as dinosaurs. No transitional forms to make the dinosaurs, but they're evidence of extinction. Extinction is the exact opposite of evolution. Evolution teaches we started with one organism and it branched off into many. Extinction teaches many things were created and we're running out of them. Right, good point. And this is a planet of death and extinction. Dinosaurs are one unlucky animal that uh, I believe the evidence teaches us what killed the dinosaur fossils we found. Notice I didn't say we know what killed every dinosaur because we didn't observe it. But every single dinosaur fossil dug up is found in what type of rock? Sedimentary. Right. Every dinosaur fossil found is in sedimentary rock. If a non-biased detective was trying to determine the cause of death of this dinosaur, he'd say death by burial. Now, I asked someone a question once. Well, I asked him a lot. What do you think killed the dinosaurs? They said, uh, meteors. Okay. Well, why are all dinosaur bones found in sedimentary rock? Doesn't that indicate they died from a flood? And they say, well, the meteor caused the flood. But the cause of death was burial. But sadly, closed-minded people don't like the implication of teaching that. But that's what the science teaches us. They're buried in sedimentary rock. They're fully designed. And because of that E word, I don't know if that looks like a knee, they haven't been sitting in the ground for 100 million years. Erosion. These beautiful animals would have eroded in that weak sedimentary rock a long, long time ago if they were buried that long ago. One of my projects as an engineer was for the, a building, and part of it was the driveway. So I'm talking to the, the client, we call him, and he goes, Bill, how was your weekend? I said, oh, great, I gave a creation lesson. And he goes, creation lesson, what's that? I said, oh, I'd love to give lessons on creation versus evolution. So his first question was, how old do you think the Earth is? So we're in his parking lot, and I started rubbing my boot on the asphalt, and guess what? It's falling apart. I said, Tim, asphalt can't last more than 20 years. We would love for asphalt to last 40 years, but it can't because of the sun, the rain, the wind, the temperature changes. And uh, asphalt lasts less time back east where you have more radical temperature changes. I said, Tim, asphalt can't last 20 years. How could sedimentary rock last 230 million years? He said, I never thought of that. That's a good point. So I believe dinosaurs were a wonderful design. Most of them got killed during the flood. I believe there were some on the ark. After the flood, they went extinct. But they died in the flood not too long ago because they would have been eroded by now. Right. That's a great answer. I mean, even dinosaurs, like you said, is it evidence for evolution or extinction? And not only that, it's it's the existence of, of the fossils in general is evidence of uh, a global flood. And just like you're talking about, you know, sedimentary rock layers, they even extend over entire continents or even farther. So just as you alluded to, Bill, you know, the deposition of those layers, it had to have been catastrophic or I mean, really, would there have even been much fossilization at all? It requires very special conditions, right? You got to deny it. Predators, oxygen, microbes, et cetera, and a rapid global flood could do that. Right. And on top of Mount, I had a, I, I encourage everybody to be friends with everybody and listen to their questions. What the best friend a Christian could have is a skeptic. 
because they can keep you on your toes and make you do research, okay? So I was working as an engineer and there was this brilliant guy, his name was Paul. I gave him a Bible, he was an atheist. Gave him a Bible, he read the whole thing. He didn't believe it. But once he said to me, Bill, how can you believe Mount Everest was underwater at one time? And this is in my handout too. I said, Paul, did you know that on top of Mount Everest there are seashells, fossils of ocean animals, and limestone? Limestone is mostly coral. Limestone is made up of ocean animals. I said, Paul, on top of Mount Everest, seashells, fossils of ocean animals, and limestone made of coral. And he said, well, uh, it wasn't as tall as it used to be. And I said, hallelujah, amen. That's Psalm 104. But the point is, if Paul, the reason I learned all that is because other people had stumped me on it. Like, Bill, how could the water cover Mount Everest? When I was a young creationist, I go, blah, 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 blah. can I get back to you? And then you do your research, you talk to people, and then you have answers. But I think too many Christians give up the game when they get stumped the first time. Could I ask either one of you what your favorite sport is? Uh, probably baseball and wrestling. I wrestled in high school. Okay, let's start with wrestling. The first time you wrestled, were you great? No, I, I thought I was great. Then when I you know, got onto the team for the first time, I realized I was getting my butt kicked. And did you quit or keep going? I wanted to quit, but I kept going. The second time you went, were you maybe a little bit better, but you still had a long way to go? Slightly better, but long way to go, yes. That's life. It's just like witnessing. The first time you go, you might be awful. Welcome <laughs> to life. But right. if you don't quit wrestling, you get better and better. And after a while, oh, I recognize this move. I know what to do. So engage people who disagree with you. Respect them and never be ashamed to say, I don't have an answer to that. Can I get back to you? And you will learn more instead of stay, staying in your safe little igloo or whatever. Get out and talk to people. Let them stump you and research. I used to play a lot of tennis, and I read a quote. Fill in the blank for me, guys. You will never get better unless you play tennis against people who are what than you? Better. Yeah. For all you tennis players, out, did you guys play tennis? I have played. I'm not very good at it, though, Bill. Well, if you play someone who really stinks, you're not improving your game at all. <laughs> but you get it. If you play someone better than you, it's like, my goodness, I got to work on my second serve. Yes, good so point. Engage people. Talk. Keep it friendly. Oh, and getting back to suffering, if there wasn't a promise of life after this life, God would be a sadist. You know, that might sound sacrilegious, but he's not a sadist. This is temporary. Momentary light afflictions are producing an eternal way to glory. So if you're only focused on this life, it is a cruel God, but he's a loving, graceful God. So keep that in mind, everybody, please. Amen. I appreciate that answer, Bill. Uh, I, I do have a couple more questions here. It looks like we just passed the hour mark, but this has flown by. It's been a blast. I hope we can um, you know, do many, many more of these. Um, but a, a question, you know, that I have here in regards to evolution, uh, you know, the universal common ancestry type of evolution, they'll say, you know, natural selection. Uh, we talked about mutations earlier, but natural selection, can that actually be used as evidence to vindicate that type of bacteria to biologist evolution? Absolutely not. Natural selection is evidence of extinction and loss of information. And here's my example. And again, I'm not selling it, but in my handout, I've got natural selection example. Okay, let's suppose the three of us go to Alaska in the wintertime and I take my dogs with me. We come back home and I go, I forgot my dogs. I left a furry dog and a hairless dog in Alaska in the summertime. Well, these beautiful dogs fall in love, get married, and make puppies, and they have a mixture. Some are furry, some are hairless. Winter comes. What's going to happen? 
those furless ones aren't going to do too good. First, they're going to scream mucho frio and then die. The hairy dogs can survive. They reproduce. They make mostly hairy dogs. But the fancy word phenotype might exist, and a hairless dog might show up now and then. But the next winter is going to wipe that guy out. After a while, let's see that. After a while, all you're going to have from this generation are furry dogs. If these beautiful dogs were left in a hot desert, what would the generation generation four be? Hairless dogs. You see that? Right. Yeah. You leave these dogs where it's cold, only the furry survive. You leave them where it's warm, only the hairless. But you're losing genetic information with natural selection. It's a million percent true. Another quick example, we take every animal from the San Diego Zoo and dump them in Alaska. We come back next year. Hey, where's the flamingos? Right? Uh, where are the tigers? They're gone. They froze to death. Hey, there's a penguin. There's a polar bear. That's natural selection. But it's extinction. It's killing things off. Evolution has to go up the hill. Natural selection is going down the hill. So natural selection, a million percent true, evidence for extinction, not new information appearing. That's it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, sorry. Evolution is like a three-legged stool. For a three-legged stool to stand up, all three legs need to stand up. The three legs are mutation, natural selection, and time. We talked about mutation. Mutation is extinction. It's death. It's downhill. We just talked about natural selection. Extinction, death, things going downhill. Now we talk about time, the third leg of the evolutionary stool. Time is the enemy of evolution. People say time like time has an IQ of infinity. Time has an IQ of zero. Thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, teaches in a closed system, entropy increases over time. Good energy becomes bad energy. Here's an example of the second law of thermodynamics. Standing, suppose I locked you into a room, nothing can come in, nothing can come out. What's going to happen to you in about a year? So I'm locked in a room, nothing can come in, nothing can come out, I'll, I'll die. Yep, no hockey games either. You're going to really suffer, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, so nothing come in. You cannot get energy from the outside. If the door can open, now that's an open system. Food can come in and you can survive. But the universe, every atom in the universe is a closed system. For you to stay alive, you got to take good energy from somewhere else, and that's costing the entire system. So time is the enemy of evolution. Time leads to increased entropy. You're going down the slope again. So the three legs, the three legs of the stool of evolution, natural selection, death and extinction. Time, death and extinction. Mutation, death and extinction. Zero plus zero plus zero doesn't equal infinity. It equals zero. One leg doesn't stand, evolution falls apart. None of the legs can stand. I just hope people have an open mind and seek truth instead of bias. I think that was the perfect answer, Bill. I mean, you said it earlier. You know, we observe devolution and not evolution. Natural selection is a selection process, a fine-tuning, you know, process. Just like, you know, the dogs, you can get dogs to adapt to cold, dogs to adapt to, to, to heat, but they're never going to – you know, grow wings and fly. It's just not in, in the gene code. And like you said, evolution needs uphill changes, new novel information. So um, I, I love that answer. I, I think that was perfect. Actually, that kind of it's um, – I got an audience question here. His name's Christian Crusader, and it's, it's kind of based on what you just talked about, adaptation, natural selection, for example. Um, Bill, he, he asks, and word for word, wouldn't African Americans – or humans living in the African continent who are hunter-gatherers showing evolution by reproducing and passing down their genetics? So I think he's asking, is that evolution? 
But once again, remember we said evolution is a word. Right. It means one thing to one person, one thing to another. And not to divert, uh, I really, if I do have a strength, as I'm as far from an intellectual slob you'll ever meet. <clears throat> Are the three of us more wise than a person who lives in New Guinea? In what way? <laughs> ah, exactly. Yes and no. We would die in about two days out there, guys, right? But these very wise, skillful hunters, they're survivors out there, man, right? So right. they have incredible skills to live where we would be toast in no time, okay? So we should never be arrogant. And, oh, they're a hunter-gatherer, and I'm a website designer. I'm better than they are. No, no, no. I don't believe that for one bit. Before I became an engineer, I worked construction, and I mean it. I saw much more wisdom in the construction guys than the engineers, okay? Brilliant people. So I'm not putting that down at all. So I believe the people in Africa uh, are hunter-gatherers. They're extremely dedicated to staying alive and excellent in what they do and that they need to survive. And we are devolving because we have such a big safety net for our survival. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. I don't need to go to school. The government will take care of me, right? Well, <laughs> in the 1930s, people treated school like it was life and death because they had to eat. They had to learn a trade, right? So I admire the people that have to hunt in Africa for a meal. I'm not better than they are. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I think that's uh, I think that's a, a great question. And you kind of um, talked about it earlier, how adaptation, natural selection, fine tuning, um, it does lead to change. It does lead to say new traits, for example, you know, with the dogs, with the long hair, with the short hair, but it's, it's based on a loss of information. Would that help us to logically conclude that the original creation, because a lot of people will ask, you know, how do we get all the species today? from the original created kinds, would that be based on say pre-programmed, you know, genetic variation, genetic information, and now it's just been, you know, a sorting out process since creation? You know, what's the best way to answer that type of question? Okay, going back to this thing, did the genes for the hairless dog and the furry dog exist in this generation? Yes. Yes, when you get down yeah. to here, was there any new genetic information? No, well, no, it was a loss of the loss. Right. So we, as science loving Christians, would simply say there was more information in the genome of the original canine, feline, equine, etc. Right. I called Dr. John Sanford a little while ago. And I said, Dr. Sanford, if we took, say, a male house cats, a DNA and artificially inseminated a tiger in the wild, would it produce an offspring? And he said, most likely, yes. Now, physically, they would never mate, and someone might say, oh, they're different species. Well, physically, they're not going to get close to it. Well, the little cat's going to run away because he's going to be a meal, right? But genetically, they could. And that strengthens our case that in the beginning, they were all of the same feline kind. And over time, some became small, some became tigers, but the genetics existed in the past and it, nothing nothing new under the sun. It, it was there at the beginning. Right, no, I think that's a great answer. Just like you said, nothing new um, under the sun. Um, I've got one question here, Bill, if you don't mind. It's from, it's one of the, uh, someone in the audience. Um, Brandon Root, he, his question is, you know, what is the best evidence for God? Excellent. For me, it's the D word, design. You look behind me, and there's a quilt. Brandon, suppose I told you that quilt is a result of millions of years of yarn or fabric just mixing together. There's even a duck on that quilt. Brandon would think to himself, this guy is nuts. Somebody smart made that quilt. Well, there's an image of a duck. Is a living duck infinitely more complex than a duck on a quilt? I would ask Brandon. You'd probably say yes. 
would that require a designer who's infinitely more smart than the one who made that? And here comes my design dog. Hello. This is a design, Brandon. This dog is not the result of chance. Look at those teeth, every teeth. How come my dog's got straight teeth, but my kids don't? But if there's a design, there has to be a designer. Now, is there a purpose for that quilt? Was that quilt made for a purpose? What do you guys think? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Was your laptop that you're looking at, was that made for a purpose? Oh, yeah. The law of causality. Brandon Root, were you made for a purpose? I say yes. Anytime a designer made anything, there's a purpose for it. Brandon Root, I don't know who you are, but I do know one thing. Unless you're an identical twin, there's nobody that's ever been identical to you. We know that through DNA. You were created for a purpose, and that's logic, that's science, and that to me is overwhelming evidence that there is a designer creator God. And the smartest thing anyone can do is look into it. Maybe I'm nuts, but look into it. It's very important, much more important than even hockey. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Another, um, another great answer. Um, I think a good question to end it on, uh, Bill, is – I know for me, I, I listened to your coast to coast interview and I, I thought it was great. It, it flew by, you know, it was, a, it was a really, really good interview and carbon dating and radiometric dating was brought up in regards to the age of the universe. And you had a really good explanation. I think it involved a snowman. Um, I just, I really enjoyed the answer. Could you elaborate on that? Okay. Well, I'm originally from Buffalo. And we had season tickets for 13 years. That's why I keep talking about hockey. But I'm out here. That's why they're so bad now. But anyways, suppose we're going skiing. And we're going up the hill, and we see a melted snowman. It's about half melted. And I said to you guys, how old do you think that snowman is? When did they make the snowman? Could science tell you when that snowman was made? Well, I think it's going to be based on some assumptions. Yep, a lot of assumptions. You could get out there with a tape measure and say, hey, Bill, it's currently two and a half feet tall, one foot diameter. I don't care about that. How old is it? Well, it's made out of ice, frozen water. I don't care about that. When was it made? Well, you'd say, well, I assume it was four feet tall when it was made. I assume the temperature for the last two weeks has been 38 degrees. Uh... It's one week old. Well, you labeled a lot of assumptions there. The original condition, what happened in between, and the rate that it froze. So assumption plus assumption plus assumption never equals a fact. Suppose I handed you some pure lead. And I said, how old is this lead? Well, if it used to have uranium in it, which could all be gone, you would have to make all kinds of assumptions. You follow me? You, science is awesome. But anytime you try to prove something in the past, there has to be assumptions. Science can't prove Abraham Lincoln was a president. It can provide overwhelming evidence that it was, but can't prove it. Now, bad philosophers say science can't prove anything, which is nonsense. In the present, science can prove a lot of good things. If you give me the right refrigerant at the right pressure and the right temperature, I can give you cooling or heating. But things in the past, you cannot base upon assumptions. Now, on my website, I talk about the age of the earth and radiometric dating. More than half the dates have to be thrown out because the dates they come up with don't match the model or the assumption of how old it should be. So here's a fun trivia question. Ready? This is a complex one. Which came first? The assigned date that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago? Or did radiometric dating come first? Take a wild guess. What do you guys think? 
First one. The assigned date of dinosaurs going extinct came well before radiometric dating. Oh, yeah. Radiometric dating was introduced to the world in the 1950s. And about the turn of the century, people were saying dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. So if you go to Guelph or you go to Vancouver or Texas and you say, when did dinosaurs go extinct? They'll say 65 million years ago. Well, how do people know that? What are they going to say? <laughs> radiometric dating. Yeah. No, radiometric dating came about 50 years after the assigned date. If the radiometric dating doesn't convey 65 million years or more, they say, oh, the, the sample's contaminated. You follow me? But they think the science led to the date, but they only accept the science if it agrees with the dates that they know are true and that the knowing is not from science. How about, um, there was a question probably about stellar evolution then. How about uh, light speed? The trout light speed that that's how they say that the universe is very old okay first i know absolutely zero arguments for a young or an old earth okay and well sometimes when i have fun if i'll go to a church and the pastor will say bill are you a uh, young earth or old earth i say oh i'm old earth six thousand years old that's a joke thank you very much <laughs> i like that one i'm here all week but that's a long time six thousand <laughs> But I don't know of one good old earth argument. The sun, the erosions is beating us up, mutations. But I tell someone, if I was old earth, my number one argument would be distant starlight. Okay? So it is fair to grant them that is a good argument. But let me ask you a few questions I would ask the person. You can answer if you want. but. Uh, if you don't want to, I'll throw it in there. The person says, hey, Bill, how can you believe in a young Earth when we have stars that are 13 and a half billion light years away? First question, I ask them for a one word answer. What does a star light, what does a light year measure? One word answer. Do you know what it measures? Just um, distance. distance. A light year measures distance. Let's stay on that thought. If something is 13.5 billion light years away, it's really what from us? One word answer. Distance. Right, it's really <laughs> far. Distance, right, yeah, really far. The universe is really, 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 one word answer. Big. <laughs> yeah. paragraph. We all agree the universe is huge. I would ask the person, is the universe expanding? Absolutely yes. expanding. Yeah. The universe is bigger today than it was yesterday. Now, the universe is huge. I propose it could be huge and young. All right? I will be honest. I've read about it. I've researched it. I don't have a great mechanism to explain a young, huge universe. But... They are making assumptions themselves. They're assuming they know the starting points of these distant stars and quasars, okay? Maybe they were closer in the past when they were created. The fact it's an expanding universe gives credence to the young Earth side. If it was huge and static, it would be a lot more difficult, agree? Okay? Yes. But uh, in my comic book here, I call it my comic book, my IQ quiz, I've referenced five different authors in the Bible who never met each other that said God stretched the heavens. I believe the Bible talked about the heavens being stretched. That means expanding. So I will look that person in the eye and I'll say, I believe the universe is young, huge, and expanding. And I'd be lying to you if I had a real simple mechanism to explain that. Okay. But they're assuming, and I'm not being snide here that they know everything about space, everything about light, everything about time to be absolute. This means it has to be old. Follow me? So since it's expanding, it gives more credence to our argument. But again, it's best not to lie. Maybe there are great arguments, but I believe the universe was not as big as when God created it and has stretched it 
so it could be young and huge. That's my yeah. What they don't realize is that they have a light travel problem of their own. It's called the horizon problem. And so, mm -hmm. you know, they uh, they look at our model and just say, hey, well, I can't, you know, it's too big for light to be like that, but they have their own trouble. So I find that ironic. Could you explain it briefly to the layman like me? Uh, yeah, well, uh, the, the light itself is uh, basically light is traveling at a constant speed. So if if it was expanding, we should be able to see stars at a certain distance that we're not able to see. So they're saying now that the, the expansion is probably causing this, this fluctuation to be a problem, but they don't really have a reason for it. They can't explain it very good. So right now it's just called the problem, the horizon problem, because on the far horizon, light is supposedly maybe traveling at a different speed based on temperature. That's why the Mac, Max Planck Institute in Germany is working with temperature fluctuations to change light speed. So they're, uh, they found the colder it gets, the slower light travels. They're trying to figure out the horizon problem, essentially. Yeah, light could travel different in space. I'm not saying it does or doesn't. But one thing I do know is the Hubble constant was involved in the expansion rate, and the Hubble constant wasn't constant. They kept changing it throughout history. And other people are more astute at astronomy. But I would maintain that I believe a young, huge, expanding universe. But I'm always willing to listen to people. And I'm going to look at the horizon and horizon problem amen brother you know what I, I enjoyed every single answer and every single minute of this um, interview um, I, I really hope we can do this again soon I think there's a dozen more questions we could ask over another hour and a half period um, so once again I want to thank you Bill for for coming on and giving us your time um, are there any you know final words and anything um, last that, that you'd like to say before we um, end the interview? Well, first, uh, I'm humbled and honored to be on your show. Uh, what What's more important than talking about God? Anyone who's on the fence, I know there's peer pressure. What are my friends going to think? What are my parents going to think? Well, you got to follow truth no matter what other people think. And other people will notice. Don't let peer pressure keep you from following what is true. And there's no more important answer to a question than this question. What do you think will happen to you after you die? I'd love to establish friendships with people and ask them that question. A lot of people, I don't want to think about it. Or some people, that's all I think about. Well, sadly, people are not being shared the biblical answer that this is not a cruel God. This is a loving God. We're stuck in a fallen, short existence. And after this, uh, there's heaven and hell. Read your Bible. And the key to heaven is forgiveness. And forgiveness is for those who have Jesus as Lord. Most people don't know what Lord means, even in the church. Lord means master, ruler, or king. You do your best to follow the master. But you know what I love to share with people? We're all a bunch of screw ups. The first time I read the Bible after being an atheist, well, let me ask a fun question. Is the Bible full of mistakes? Yes, hundreds of mistakes. Adam made mistakes. Eve made mistakes. Noah made mistakes. Abraham, David. And the biggest mistake I had all was Peter. Peter was a major screw up, right? So the cool thing is, is we have to do our best to follow God, but he understands we're human. We mess up. We need to keep him as Lord, do our best, and ask for forgiveness for our humanness, for our messing up. And the easiest way to really know God is real is creation. And it's a shame more people aren't hearing that because everybody's going to die. Now's the time to figure out what's true and what's not. I know. I, I remember hearing you on Coast to Coast Radio, and when you were talking, I think his name was John Norrie, right? Um, George Norrie. George Norrie, that's right. Uh, I, I've i listened to him before a lot. Matter of fact, he talks, he believes in aliens, he believes in Bigfoot, he believes that the earth is hollow. But when you ask him, would you consider creation, He was it, it was hard for him to say maybe. It was very I, 
just to go back a little bit, I remember he said, Bill, I, I liked him very much. If you could ask one question to my audience, what would it be? And my question was never what I asked, do you believe in evolution? My question was, do you believe you have bacterial ancestors? And Mr. Nori at the end of the show said no, which is wonderful. And most of the audience said no. And if people look at it that way, they'll see the folly of evolutionism. Right. I, I remember seeing that too. They did a, a poll and it looked like, I think the higher percentage was, was people that said, you know, man came from man and not bacteria like organisms. And same with George Nori, which, which is interesting. And I find that on a daily basis too, uh, just talking to people at work or just people I come across, you know, they'll say things like, well, you don't believe in evolution. And once I actually get into it, um, you know, how, you know, evolutionists would believe that bacteria ultimately turned incrementally over time into a whale and that whales and humans are related, they'll often admit, yeah, that is kind of silly. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people don't realize, obviously you have your militant atheists and evolutionists out there, um, you know, especially on the internet and constantly fighting, but just from personal experiences, I mean, it's quite easy to get uh, these people to admit, yeah, you know what, it is kind of silly to believe that, you know, bacteria like organisms ultimately changed into a human being. It's just anti-science and anti-common sense. And uh, I'm not boasting, but one of my favorite things to do is my friends and I, my family, we go to high schools when kids get out and we offer them this. And you'll see most people are just innocent and completely naive or ignorant of anything about God, creation, or evolution. They're just going through life day by day by day. And it's wonderful to talk to these people who are not thinking about tomorrow. And you'd right. be sure how many young, healthy people think about, oh, I think about my death all the time. And the Bible has solid answers and truth. Everybody should be seeking truth. But some of these people abused as a kid. Their mom died. They saw the horrors of war are fighting God when they should just be humble to God. Right. They, they should be humble. Absolutely. I, I always say, you know what? Salvation is easy. Jesus did all the work, you know, just, just put your faith on him. It's, you know, it's, it's not hard if it were hard. And if it were based on our works, nobody could get to heaven. And it really comes down to, you know, humility. It, it really comes down to bowing down and just admitting that, you know, we can't save ourselves. Um, you know, we, we need Jesus for salvation. And just like you said earlier, Bill, you know, creation in and of itself really is a, a, an amazing testimony to our creator. And to think that our creator did that for us, you know. And just think how often he was disappointed. Uh, the 12 disciples could be called the 12 knuckleheads. I mean, <laughs> but I love them. They were just like us. Right. And just like, yeah. Lord and uh, had forgiveness. So uh, if we do future shows, I can talk about the secrets to life. But uh, real quick, I like to ask people this. Can alcohol, drinking a lot of alcohol make you happy? I think some might say temporarily. Yep, three hours. Can drugs make you happy? Temporarily. Three hours, right. Can fooling around well, we're all men on this, but fooling around where you shouldn't be fooling around make you happy. Yes. Yes. Okay. Temporarily, yeah. Do you know anyone whose life was messed up by drinking too much? Absolutely, yes. Me too. Drugs? Drugs, yes. You know, and uh, fooling around, people's life messed up by fooling around. All three, yes. This is so important. Everyone listening, young people, older people, Short-term fun can ruin your life. Short-term discipline, self-control can give you a long, healthy, happy life. God is not trying to ruin your fun by saying, wait till you're married. Don't get plastered on alcohol. He's protecting you. When I was 14, I didn't want to listen to that. I wanted to do this, this, and this. God is thinking long-term. Discipline can give you a long-term happy life.
And the people that use drugs are looking for a three hour vacation from their problems, but they're gonna be there once they sober up, they're gonna probably be worse. But my heart breaks for these people because I've known so many of them. Amen. I, I really, I really appreciate that, Bill. Yeah, I think, I think our next broadcast, our next interview or dialogue, we can certainly touch on those things. I, I can tell already everybody enjoyed it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy the way that this turned out. I think, I think it was awesome. So once again, I wanna, I wanna thank you, Bill. Uh, thanks so much, Matt. Uh, you know, for helping uh, with this interview and, and, and setting it up and, and getting Bill on here because. Uh, I think it was great. So thank you so much, gentlemen. And hopefully we can, uh, we can do this again soon. Thank you. I was very honored to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, God bless. And Standing for Truth is out, guys.